Today, I wanted to introduce you to some Art Deco inspired knitting patterns and some fabulous Manhattan Art Deco architecture. And action. Welcome back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy. Today, we're going to be talking about Art Deco a lot Art Deco sweater patterns and Art Deco architecture. And a very extraordinary architect named Ralph Walker, sort of like the godfather of Art Deco skyscrapers in Manhattan. So if you're not familiar with him, don't go away. We're going to do a deep dive. Let me kick it off by saying that one of my longtime subscribers, a woman named Colette, periodically sends me things that she thinks I might find interesting. Or just a simple little link to Sirdar Patterns sent me off researching which buildings inspired these patterns. And today I'm going to show you a little look at some of those because I found it very interesting. I hope that you will too. Before I go there, let me show you what I'm working on. You'll remember from last week that I finished not one, but two sweaters. And this week I was able to get to the post office to mail them off to my son in San Francisco, where I think it's gonna still be cool enough for him to get some use this season out of these two really nice wool sweaters that I made for him. I'll insert a couple of pictures here so that you can have a look. I don't know how this is going to work for him because it takes a certain amount of delicateness to care for a wool sweater. I sent him a small bottle of Eucalon, which by the way, if you're not familiar with it, there's a link in my show notes below where you can go and purchase some. Eucalon is a wool wash that requires no rinsing. So you just put a little into your basin, put your sweater in, swoosh it around, let it soak for a little while, and then empty out the water, kind of squeeze out as much as you can, lay it out flat to dry. I don't think that's too hard, um, but I really had to emphasize to him, no washing machine ever. The agitation will cause it to felt and or pill. Um, and possibly shrink, so no, no machine. But I think he should be able to just roll in a towel, lay it out, and let it dry. So now that I finished those two, plus I finished my little blush-colored Spencer, it freed me up to go back to some projects that I've been working on for quite a while, too long in the case of this. Could I possibly end at the end of a row? No, I'm mid row, but you'll get the, the idea of it. It is coming along. I think the last time I showed it to you, it wasn't nearly this long. Wow, I can't even fit it on the screen. So if I hold it to my neck, it's coming to almost my hip. So I would say I'm probably about halfway through. I mean, I want it to really go around and have some drapiness to it. Um, this was one of the colors that was left over from my genie. Oh, that reminds me, I, you know, I wanted to pull out a couple things to show you that are knit with this same yarn. So I'll be right back. Well, you may recall that this was my genie. There are nine different colors in here. The main color, which is the background here, and a lot of the ribbing is done in this uh, blush tone. That's the yarn that I used for the Spencer. In here, this dark green is the yarn that I used for my Sirdar Chevron. Um, this was the first Color Mart yarn that I ever ordered. And because in order for me to get the right gauge, the right weight of yarn for this pattern, I needed to hold three strands of this wool together. So it's Color Mart NM2. 
two over 30. It's extra fine merino. It's really got a beautiful drape. It's lovely. Even though it's three strands of this, it's kind of like a lace weight. It's making more like a fingering weight sweater. The Spencer, I held two strands together. This was single strand, but because it's fair aisle and there are all the floats behind it, it has more body. But you, you might be able to see this is very, it's very thin. I mean, the reason I made it sleeveless was because I thought the thinness of it would be suitable for summer. I mean, not a really hot, humid summer day, but it's very lightweight. I wish there was a way for me to show you just how, how thin it is. Anyway, so this is the yarn. It comes on these cones. For the Spencer, I ordered a cone that was 150 grams. This was only 50 gram cone. And I didn't use very much of this chartreuse color in the genie. It's just little bits here to give it a little pop. Um, each one of these darker bands has a little flash of that color. It's almost negligible. You can see a little bit right there. In see in here it's just a couple of little stitches here and there so I still had most of this cone left and I decided that this would be a good color for a scarf for me because I, I tend to wear a lot of black and gray or black and white and I thought this is really nice way of getting like a shock of color just as an accent you know it'll be complementing whatever else I'm wearing um the pattern name it's something Ibiza it's lace it's a fairly complicated design leave it to me to find the most complicated stitches to hook together um, here, in addition to yarn overs, which are making these holes, there's also knit two together, there's knit three togethers, there's some past slip stitch overs, there's a lot of knitting through the back loop and purling through the back loop. Now, when I was in Shetland, and there are all these Shetland lace knitters there, the local people, when I showed them this, they were like, ooh, we never do anything like that because it's very tedious to keep switching and, you know, maneuvering your yarn back and forth. Um, they also tend to knit things that are, I think, where the pattern is just on one side and then you purl back. There are a lot of lace motifs that do that. Not this. Every single row has a different pattern. So in order for me to be able to travel with this, I don't want to have to keep referring to my phone where I have the instructions. So I copied each of the lines. There's 32 different rows. Each line has a repeat of 15 stitches. And you might have noticed that I keep stitch markers to section those off because every once in a while with lace, you tend to run into a little problem. You don't, something doesn't come out right. You're supposed to be arriving at a knit through the back loop and you can clearly see that it's a pearl. So the first thing you do, the first defense is check the number of stitches because you might be off. If you have 14 or 16, it's not too hard to fix that. Um, but yeah, that's a tip if you haven't knit lace before. But for this pattern, every single one of the 15 stitches is different. Sometimes it's a little cluster of stitches that you repeat twice or a little cluster of stitches that you repeat three times within that set of 15. It's complicated. <laughs> you know, let's just leave it at that. It is a complicated 
there's no way that you could be memorizing this. Even within a row, I'm going to do, let's see how many repeats. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm doing eight repeats. The pattern, I think, calls for many more, but I was afraid of not having enough yarn to do a shawl with, so I just did it narrow with. Anyway, I have those eight repeats. They're too complicated, those 15 stitches, for me to remember from the first repeat to the second repeat to the third. So it's not like when I get to the end of the row, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. And it's not a pattern that's easy to read because as you can see, it keeps shifting from left to right. Also, I have no idea which is the right side or the wrong side because they both are equally complex. So this is what I'm working on. This is now my traveling project because the, the whole thing is this. I still have a lot more to do and it's probably not ever gonna be much bigger than this. So really transportable. If I'm going to the doctor's office, it's easy enough for me to carry this in my handbag. So that's my current whip. I'm afraid you'll be seeing more of it because it's a long way from completion. And then I just started in knit along with a small group of people. There is time for you to join on. I'll leave a link below. We're still at the very, very beginning and it's only a one skein project. So you can catch up very quickly. In fact, I'm kind of almost done my project. Um, I kind of uh, segued away from completing this. I could have completed it in just a few days, but I wanted to let the other people in the knit along get caught up. So right now it's completely off my needles. Um, it's a pair. Let's see. I, I do have the thumbs on stitch holders, but the rest of the rest of the stitches, I just yanked the needles out. I know I'll be able to go around and pick those stitches up. They're not really going anywhere. Um, but I, I like to knit things like this in tandem. So when I do put this back on my needles, I'll be going through this way in the front stitches and through this way in the back stitches and I'll work my way around front, front, back, and then the other back. I don't know if you can follow that. So imagine that, imagine that the stitches are on here. The back stitches of the first glove are here, the back stitches of the second glove are here. The front stitches are here and the front stitches of the other glove are here. So I would be knitting across here and then switching to the next glove and across here and then continuing around to the back of that glove and going here and then dropping that yarn and hopping over to the yarn that was left up here. I'll just pull it to the back and continue knitting across this and same thing around here with the same yarn to the front drop that yarn, pick up the yarn for the next glove. This is a pattern by Suzanne Bryan. She has a free fingerless knit tutorial. There'll be a link below in the show notes. She also has a lot of videos where you can watch different segments of it. Like she does a special kind of cast on and a bind off. But really quick, easy knit. Um, most of the time my hands are on the cold side. So I think this is gonna be a really practical thing for me to have even in spring going into, um, well, summer I wouldn't need them. Although sometimes the air conditioning is quite cold. Just a little while ago, I felt my hand cramp up a little bit. So um, I might need to eat another banana, but Sometimes I think it's when it's cold that they tend to cramp. And it is a little chilly today. So anyway, 
um, I have a lot of gray jackets, sweaters. I thought this was a very neutral, usable, very functional color for me, something that I'll get a lot of wear out of because it goes with everything in my wardrobe. Um, I'm almost done. Possibly you'll see these completed soon, sooner rather than later. Why I'm not using my chow goos, why I'm using wooden needles. Well, they were available for one thing. Also, they're a little bit less slippery. And since this is kind of fiddly, fiddly going from the front to the back and all that twirling around, that, that was my choice. Okay, let me end here for, for the moment and switch over to some other footage that I prepared for you. Stick around till the end when I say goodbye. People who have watched this channel for a while know that I am crazy for the Art Deco period. decorated in 1930s, 40s fashion. And I personally like to sometimes dress and wear jewelry from that period. So it's not a big leap that she might think that I'm interested in these patterns, this is the current collection from the Sirdar Yarn Company in which they're saying they've tried to translate the architecture style of the Art Deco period into knit and crochet patterns. But personally, I prefer to work from vintage patterns if I want to get the vintage look, but I recognize that that's not for everyone. So this could be for some of you. Um, let me just scroll through and show them to you. I did peer into a few of them just to see like this one I believe is crochet. So of course that wouldn't be so much of interest to me. Although I do have a crochet pattern, a vintage crochet pattern that I'm contemplating hooking up one of these days. I did start it, but it's a little too complicated for my skill level. Anyway, that one was crochet. Many of these are knit. I thought this one was kind of interesting. When you tap on these, it tells you a little bit about the backstory. So it says it's a traveling lace design inspired by the architecture featured on the Sinclair building. I'm not familiar with the Sinclair building. Let's go take a look at it, hang on. Okay, so here's a vintage 1919 postcard showing the Sinclair building, which was the headquarters of the Sinclair Oil and Gas Company. Anyone who attended the 1964 World, World's Fair might remember that Sinclair had a pavilion there which had dinosaurs, life-size dinosaurs, because that was their logo. And they were giving out little dinosaur dolls to all the kids, like a, a plastic figure. Anyway, this building is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I guess they're referring to these motifs. So let's go back and look at the sweater. There you go. It's a little bit of a stretch for me, but I think it's a respectable, interesting looking sweater pattern. So this little exercise turned out to be kind of interesting for me. I delve deeper into this cardigan, which took me on a trip down a rabbit hole. So here it says it's the chevron stripe jacket 
Chevron patterns were popular in the 1920s. We're making them modern with this design. The chevron stripes featured on this crochet jacket are inspired by the Art Deco architecture featured on the Stella Tower in New York City. Now, I pride myself on being a New Yorker for the last 50 years, and I know a lot of architecture, not just Art Deco, but I know quite a few of the skyscrapers and other important buildings. I had never heard of the Stella Tower. So I went to investigate this. And when I found out that it was a Ralph Walker building, then I understood why he named the building the Stella Tower. Here's a photograph of the lettering over the doorway. And here's an even larger photograph. So this is where you can see that sweater is getting its inspiration from. Now, let's talk about Ralph Walker, because Stella Tower is only one of his many buildings in Manhattan. You can see how exquisite this is. Every other one of his buildings is equally fantabulous, gorgeous, if you're an Art Deco fan. New York is famous for its Art Deco architecture and its skyscrapers. And it's Ralph Walker who was a key figure in creating this signature style. Perhaps his most enduring contribution was popularizing the setback style of architecture that was necessitated by the New York sunlight zoning laws of 1916. You can see in this example, let's assume this is like the Empire State Building, which is familiar to most of you. It's set back. It allows the sunlight to come down to our street, which they're saying a typical Manhattan street is 80 feet wide. Some are narrower than that. If the building goes right up to the curb where the traffic is, it makes this envelope even narrower. Sometimes buildings are set back from the street. And when they do that, they get tax abatements. Nevertheless, in 1916, New York City was the first city to institute a citywide zoning code. It came about after the bulky equitable building was erected in Lower Manhattan in 1915. Here's an image of that building, and you can see that from corner to corner, the building goes straight up. Also, if you look at the bottom of this image, you'll notice that the street level is kind of in the shadows. And the whole left facade of the building looks like it's also in the shadows. All of New York would have been dark if they allowed all the buildings to be built in these massive things. Hence this 1916 zoning resolution. Here are some of New York's top architects dressed as the buildings that they designed. I believe this one may be Ralph Walker. In any event, he was a native New Englander born in 1889 who studied architecture at MIT. He worked in Providence, Rhode Island, Montreal, and Boston before arriving in New York in around 1916. After World War I military service in France, in 1919, he began working at Mackenzie Voorhees and Gmelin, a firm known for its work for the New York Telephone Company, which was part of the Bell System monopoly. In 1921, opportunity called for Mr. Walker. New York Telephone needed a new headquarters and Walker served as the chief designer. It was located on the full block site at 140 West Street in Lower Manhattan and named for the streets bounding it on the north and south, Barclay Vesey. Built in 1927, it's considered the first Art Deco skyscraper in New York City. 
Walker established a new prototype with this building, which he subsequently replicated with some variations for other major communications buildings, the AT&T Long Distance, Western Union. Notice the massing of this building. This tower, the facade of that is not parallel to this. So it's very unusual. And I think that was somewhat dictated by the shape of the streets that it's located on. In any event, he was noted for four key elements, exterior ornament, interior artwork and finishes, setbacks and arrangement of building form and facade articulation. Just to give you an idea of what the interior looks like, here's one shot of it. While you're gazing at this, let me tell you a little bit more about Ralph Walker. In 1957, he won the American Institute of Architects Centennial Gold Medal. He was once dubbed architect of the century by the New York Times. In fact, Frank Lloyd Wright called him the only other honest architect in America. His clients included most of the top communications companies of the day. And I'm gonna show you some of those other buildings in just a moment. For over 40 years, he and his wife Stella lived on Roaring Brook Road in Chappaqua, Westchester County. Chappaqua, incidentally, is the town where Bill Clinton and Hillary Rodham Clinton currently live. Uh, the Walker's property was given the bucolic moniker Walker Burn, and it, Stella was his first wife, by the way. Okay, let's take a look at the AT&T Long Distance Building. The 26-story Long Distance Building was completed in 1932 but was actually an expansion and recladding of an older New York telephone facility and was critical for improving telecommunications both nationally and abroad. Walker once remarked, I am the analyst of beauty, so to speak, but the final design is the work of many minds, each contributing something to it. This is evident in the long distance building lobby where credit for the attractive artwork goes to muralist Hildreth Meir. On the ceiling, she was commissioned by Walker's firm to design continents linked by the telephone and wireless, a silhouette mosaic with golden lines connecting allegorical figures representing communication and the continents. To represent continents linked by the telephone and wireless, she designed these four classically influenced individual art deco figures personifying Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia around the rim of the ceiling. These continents are linked to two female messengers, an eagle and a condor in the center through gold lines representing the telephone and wireless. A rich border reminiscent of Native American quill work completes the composition. It's accompanied by a tile wall map proclaiming that telephone wires and radio unite to make neighbors of nations. The motif continues with lines on the floors and walls and also fits in well with the angular Art Deco exterior. The firm of Voorhees, Mellon and Walker was the logical choice when Western Union Telegraph Company needed a new headquarters in the late 1920s. Although the company was not part of the Bell system, it had once been owned by AT&T and still occupied space in AT&T buildings. With both companies growing and shared tenancy no longer viable, Western Union acquired a full block site at 60 Hudson Street, close to the long distance building for construction of a new home. Attention to the arrangement of building form is also reflected in the main building entrance. Walker had a basic formula customized for each project, which as demonstrated by Western Union, consisted of slightly recessed portals with distinctive facade treatments, such as patterned metalwork over glazing above the doors. Doesn't it remind you of the entrance to Stella Tower? The final building that I wanted to share with you 
is number one Wall Street, which had previously been known as the Irving Trust Company building, the Bank of New York building, and the BNY Mellon building. It's a 50-story tall skyscraper. And this building just south of it was added on a shorter building. But the original building was designed by Ralph Walker of the firm Voorhees, Mellon and Walker, constructed between 1929 and 1931. The facade made of limestone contains slightly inwardly curved bays with fluting to resemble curtains. On the lower stories are narrow windows with mullions as well as ornate entrances. Just inside the Wall Street entrance is what has become known as the Red Room, a large space with a ceiling stretching 33 feet or 10 meters high. It was designed as the reception room rather than a banking room. It measures 100 feet or 30 meters long, stretching the entire distance between the western and eastern facades and is 40 feet or 12 meters wide. The walls and ceilings are decorated with 8,911 square feet of red and gold mosaics designed once again by Hildreth Meir and manufactured by the Ravenna Mosaic Company in Long Island City and in Berlin. The walls are made of Pyrenees black marble and the columns are made of Verona red marble, a similar design to that of Stockholm City Hall. The floor is made of red terrazzo tiles and Ralph Walker and his associate Perry Coke Smith personally supervised the creation of the floor tiles in Berlin. Here are a couple more photos of details of the beautiful red room. Of course, the image on the right is just to give you a sense of the scale. I've been fortunate enough to be inside of this space. It's now been converted to a condo. So it's very difficult to gain access, but I had been in there many years ago before that happened. I'd like to dedicate this episode to my late father, whose name also was Ralph. He would be celebrating his 103rd birthday this coming week. He had the great fortune of living to age 94, and I'm very happy to have some of those genetics. I hope you enjoyed this. It's a little bit of an unusual episode for me, but now and again, I, I try and give you a little something to listen to while presumably you're knitting along. Don't forget, if you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up, and if you haven't subscribed, I encourage you to do so and don't forget to ring the notifications bell so that you will know when I'm coming out with my next episode. Well, that wraps it up for this week. Thanks again for being here. If you stayed till the end, I salute you. Uh, take good care, everyone. Be well. Ciao.